Okay, so as Pam mentioned, I'm a mom of three sons, and I was born in Denmark and uh, moved to Nigeria, West Africa for the first six years of my life. I then lived in Paris and went to an English school in Paris and then moved to England where I went to boarding school at 14 and went to university. Um, when I was 25, I decided to uproot my life and come to the U.S. And I met my husband through an ad in the newspaper, because in those days, there was no internet dating. So, we've been married now 26 years. I had my first son when I was 30, my second at 32, and my third at 36. And at the time, we were living in Irvine. And so, during my 30s, what was important to me was my house, my family. And I was totally into remodeling, doing all the things to make my house beautiful. I was very competitive, and I was, I suppose, materialistic. Then we moved to Lake Forest, and there we moved to a beautiful five-bedroom home. And it was on the lake, but my husband was working extremely long hours commuting to LA, not every day, but quite frequently, stuck in gridlock on gridlocked freeways, and we had many bills, and we never seemed to get ahead. I was a stay-at-home mom, although I did have a few jobs, like personal trainer and a few home businesses as I went along. But my husband was growing more and more stressed, and I felt like my children weren't getting the attention that they deserved. Um, and when our oldest son turned 13, our life changed. I will read you an excerpt from uh, my book. Two months after Steve turned 13, life in our household changed. A large truck pulled, out, pulled onto our driveway. It was a typical winter day in Southern California, the kind where December gets confused with August, and you end up wearing a tank top and shorts while there's a decorated Christmas tree in your living room. I opened the garage door and saw the man. A short, dark-haired male with tattooed biceps stepped down from one of those cranked-up trucks with oversized tires. Are you Steve's mom? the man asked, angling his neck upward to make eye contact. This did not feel like the start of a pleasant conversation and I debated whether to say no just to get rid of him or at least postpone our talk until Duke, my husband, returned from Home Depot. Yes, I said, why? Well, Steve broke into my house at 2 a.m. on Christmas morning, he said. I leaned against the frame of the garage door for support, my heart racing. So that's why Steve had slept in. Who was this man? He jumped into my daughter's bedroom window, the stranger continued. So, at 13, my son was six foot one, and he always seemed much older. People thought he was in high school. And unfortunately, uh, things got a little bit worse in high school. He started ditching high school, and he had this teenage defiance, which was affecting our family life, because I wasn't able to give the attention to my other two children. And my youngest son at the time was seven, obsessed with video games. Um, he was constantly whining for more stuff, and my husband and I started getting a little bit fed up with the entitled attitude, attitude, uh, entitlement attitude of, um, of the children. And um, so, at Christmas, when we had gifts, this is not my tree, but anyway, um, I would get really frustrated when my kids would just open one present after another and not really pay attention to what was in the box, just rip the paper off and say next. And this started to really frustrate me because I guess I thought, you know, I don't want my kids spoiled. And grandparents obviously like to bring in piles of gifts as well, so it would uh, multiply. So uh, another thing in our neighborhood was not everyone, but certain parents would think that it was fine. Oh, sorry, this way. I hope it goes to the second slide. Um, to give their kid a brand new car. 
Now, I know this is a BMW, but there were some parents who were giving brand new trucks, brand new everything to, to children, and we thought, what, what is there to look forward to in life if you give your children everything at 16 or even younger? So, um, this, together with my son's uh, attitude, just made life more and more unpleasant, and I started to realize that uh, we needed to do something. So, the only way that my husband and I relaxed was we both had this passion for the Caribbean. And we used to love listening to reggae music when we would relax with a glass of wine and listen to Bob Marley. And we'd talk about how we longed to one day go to a Caribbean island and live a simple life. The only problem was everything was way too expensive. We couldn't find anything that we could afford. So um, we also decided why should we postpone our dreams when, until our kids are grown up? In life, you will always find excuses to not do what you want to do today. I mean, your kid, you'll have college tuition when they're older. You will have, uh, you know, maybe you'll have health issues or a parent that needs you to stay, take care of them. So you can always find excuses. And um, especially not enough money. And what will your kids think if you do something <coughs> dramatic? So, um, I selfishly was looking for my paradise and my husband was looking for adventure. I guess we, we were going through a midlife crisis in our early 40s. And um, one day, thanks to a leaking toilet, I discovered Belize. And the way I discovered Belize was the plumber who came to my house was from Scotland. And I lived in Scotland for a while, so we chit-chatted, and I said, where are you going to retire one day? And he said, Belize. I'd never heard of Belize. So I said, where is it? He said, well, it's the next country south of Mexico. So that little yellow country up here is Belize. It's very small. The population is about 280,000 people. And you might have seen it on HGTV if you watch the... Um, house program where people are buying homes. Belize comes up quite frequently these days. So um, I, he told me that you could buy oceanfront property for $15,000. And I said, I don't believe that. And islands for 100000 And I said, oh, come on, that's not true. So I started Googling Belize and it was true. You could. However, the $15,000 ocean front was not exactly a beautiful ocean. It might have been, you know, a swampy kind of ocean. But uh, you could find reasonable, reasonably priced uh, places. So I got all excited. And when my husband came home from work, after a long day on the freeway, I said, you know, I discovered Belize. We need to check it out. And... Um, Basically, what we ended up doing a few months later, after reading everything we could about Belize, was we took a scouting trip. And we went for 10 days and rented a Suzuki Samurai, which was all rusty, and it was the best adventure that my husband and I had. I mean, it was like a second honeymoon. We were on these potholed roads, dirt, uh, this rusty little Suzuki, having so much fun checking out the three different locations that we thought we could possibly move our family to. And um, we found a house to rent that was fully furnished in the northern part of Belize, which is where the schools were supposedly good. So uh, we finally uh, decided to sell our house and everything we owned. And um, let me just tell you before that what we discovered during our scouting trip about the children in Belize. Barefoot kids walked alongside the road, sucking on juicy mangoes, with orange flesh, flesh <coughs> dripping like ice cream cones in the heat. Some kids stopped to stare at our white faces. Others started running as if trying to beat our car to the finish line. Solitary shacks appeared with nothing but a hammock inside them. A few chickens roamed the premises, and sometimes a lone skinny cow or a horse remained close to a shack. I wondered whether the cow or the horse represented a local status symbol, the Belizean version of a Mercedes on the driveway. 
What a different environment from Oz back home. What would my boys think? And then we went to a city called Dangriga, which is in southern Belize. And there, as Duke and I were drive, drove through town, 10 barefoot young boys started chasing us. At a stop sign, the kids glued themselves to our Suzuki Samurai. They stuck their hands inside our window and tried to grab our belongings. Duke and I cranked the windows closed, trying not to hurt them. I never thought I could fear children, but in this case, I did. How would my boys react to seeing these kids who were around their age? So um, this, I thought it would be good for my children to experience life in a third world country. And so we sold our house. I thought we should rent, but my husband said, no, let's just sell everything because if we rent it, we're more likely to come back. And the kids, once they start whining, will say, oh, okay, well, let's, want, you know, let's just go back to the US. So we sold it. We sold our cars, our furniture, everything. And um, we moved from the house, which I'll show you, this beautiful five bedroom house in uh, Lake Forest on the lake, to a hut in northern Belize in one day. And my husband moved three months before us because he was planning on uh, getting settled and starting or continuing with legal, he's an attorney, and he wanted to basically do three, works of, three weeks of work in Belize in the hut, and then one week back in the US, and this worked out for a while. So anyway, he sent me a, and his first email about, so I told you we were supposed to stay in a house. Well, the house wasn't available when he went there. The only thing available was the hut, and this is the email I got. I think we made a mistake. Duke said, calling me after his first night in the hut. What do you mean? My heart started racing. Don't panic. Duke knew me well. It's just the hut. It's infested with bugs. You should see my legs. I look like I have chicken pox. Alex gonna freak out, I said. A scorpion landed on my pillow during the night. You're kidding, right? This didn't sound like my husband. The man who took me camping and got upset when I said, Where's the tent? Are they dangerous, I asked, concerned for our kids? Evelyn says they sting, but they don't kill you. <laughs> Noticing my lack of response, Duke added, the good news is mosquitoes only come out after rain. Normally they stay in the jungle behind our hut. When Duke described our water supply, I thought he was exaggerating. We only have cold water, and it stinks of sulfur from the well. The shower barely trickles, the pressure's too low. I hope I can fix that. Try to find another house that's less primitive. Carlos said there's nothing in Consejo Shores but the huts. So, that's where we ended up moving. <laughs> there was no glass in the windows. It was calm, fronded. And of course, there were geckos, giant ants, ants that I've never seen before that can actually hold a twig that's an inch long. These ants were everywhere. Um, other critters living with us, and the boys hated it. They wouldn't get out of the hut to explore. And the first time Alec took a shower, a scorpion came out the drain, and he went screaming around the hut saying, I'm never, ever going to get a shower again in this in this place. So anyway, so we all had wonderful body odor in this place. Um, and after a few days, they finally decided to explore the um, jungle. However, my compliance son, who's the middle one, he seems to always get the um, things go wrong with him, unfortunately. He touched a poison wood tree. And I didn't know what a poisonwood tree is. And um, this is several days after when the blisters were healing. But his eyes, within half an hour, became completely swollen and he couldn't open them any longer. And he had blisters covering his entire body. And we tried some primitive remedies because somebody told us that if you boil the leaves of the gumbo limbo tree, 
and you spread it on your blisters, they go away. Well, they didn't go away. <coughs> so you can imagine how I felt as a mom. Um, how could I have put my son's health at risk by taking him to Belize? What if the doctors weren't qualified? What if the hospitals didn't use sterilized equipment? What about AIDS? Well, actually, my husband dropped him off at a hospital, and there was a Cuban doctor, and he didn't speak a word of English, and my son didn't speak Spanish, and they started an IV. But I was fuming because I was stuck in the hut with no transportation. Husband went to take my son there, came back, and left him in the hospital. And I was like, you can't leave him. How could you possibly go back and get him right now? And he left, but he, the doctors got mad at him because they had to pull the IV out. But the thing was, it was just the fact that I was scared and didn't know, you know, anything about it. But he did heal. And for his 14th birthday, we had no presents to give, unlike the Christmas tree. Um, so what did we do? We said, well, sorry, no presents, but today we're going to see the Lamanai ruins and uh, the Mayan ruins in Belize. Uh, so that's my husband and that's uh, my 14-year-old and my youngest son who came, but the oldest one wouldn't come. The one, uh, he refused to come with us. But other things started happening. Uh, my husband is very uh, competitive as far as snorkeling and finding um, antique bottles in the ocean bottom. And he started this thing where every, the boys wanted to see how, how many old uh, glass bottles they could find snorkeling in front of our house. And um, so then the next problem that occurred was school. We had planned on sending our kids to the local school which was why we moved to Northern Belize. They speak English. And um, supposedly the schools were good. The literacy rate in Belize is 97%, is what we were told. And uh, what ended up happening was quite different because we purchased the, the books for ninth grade, uh, which uh, Alec was going into ninth grade, and it was how to tell time and how to put ING at the end of a word. And this is my studious child who was, what? What have you done? What, what about my education? <laughs> and we had no plan B. It was like, what? I couldn't come back to the US. It's the middle of summer. What are we going to do for school? Well, fortunately, we bumped into some other expats from America who had kids, and they were doing internet school, Keystone National High School accredited U.S. teachers, um, and my sons would have teachers online. And uh, so the only problem was that in the hut, <laughs> you know, internet was sporadic, and the electricity goes on and off quite frequently. Um, so you could have no electricity for several hours. So we ended up thinking, well, this is really too primitive. We should think of moving to an area where there may be more Americans. And so we found uh, the island of Ambergris Key. Has anybody heard of it? It's the tourist island in Belize. And it's the one that you always see on television. You know it? Um, and of course, we had our rat terrier, Cookie, with us. Why is this not working? Sorry. Ah, oh, sorry, one back. So Cookie gets to sit in the plane, this is a small Cessna, and sat, could sit next to the pilot. So, you know, this is kind of fun. This is actually a plane, not a car. And uh, um, so we, we found this, this house that was much, much nicer, a beach house on Ambergris Key, and there were four villas, all owned by Americans, but we were the only ones living there full time. And uh, the other Americans would rent them out to tourists. So we moved to that island, and my f husband finally could de-stress. <laughs> However, that did cause issues between him and I, but that's another story. <laughs> Um, and one good thing is that there was a family that lived here, the caretaker and his wife, 
and their little boy, little Juan, sorry, there we go, he was four. He was adorable, and my three sons adopted him immediately as a little brother, and he came over to our house all the time. He couldn't speak a word of English, and after three days, he was already speaking. I mean, uh, it was just unbelievable. Um, so, my son, jo Josh, you can see there, he's got his raincoat, and there's little Juan inside. And uh, we would take our kids to school by boat because there were no roads. So we had to purchase a boat living here on the island. We lived five miles north of town and everything we did was by boat. So that was a, a, a major change. This is how George, uh, Josh went to school. Uh, you know, I mean, amazing. The first day we took him to school, he wasn't very happy, but then there were dolphins and we said it's even better than SeaWorld. Um, and so this new Belizean family, uh, Juan, the father, was 21, the mother was 20, and little Juan was four. And I'm going to read you something about this family because it opened up the eyes of my kids and us as well. Um, okay, let me just see. Sorry. Okay. It didn't take long to bond with Juan, Teresa, and little Juan. They became our second family. They showered us with kindness, and Teresa always baked extra Johnny cakes for breakfast and brought them over still warm from her oven. They're a bit like donuts. I invited them over for an American steak dinner with baked potato and salad. We never eat steak, Teresa said. Why, are you vegetarian, I asked. No, too expensive. During dinner, Teresa chewed each piece of meat for a good five minutes before swallowing. It took her one hour to eat her T-bone steak, and I wondered whether she was being polite to finish it. Little Juan had never seen a green salad before, and with his small hand cupped over his mouth, he whispered in Teresa's ear in Spanish, why do they eat leaves from trees? <laughs> Juan translated it for us, and we all laughed, recognizing the differences between cultures. Juan and Teresa spoke Spanish at home, and yet their English was good. Juan summarized their short life together. He, Juan was only 21 and Teresa 20. They had married at, si at 17 and 16, and nine months after their wedding, little Juan arrived. I asked, what about high school? I quit school at 12 to work in the sugarcane fields, Juan said. I work from 5 in the morning to 5 in the afternoon, seven days a week. My boys turned quiet. I got paid $75, which I give my dad to pay for food. He paused, took a sip of water, and continued. I have 11 brothers and sisters. <coughs> Teresa also quit school at 12 because her parents couldn't afford the books. My boys liked Juan and listened to every word he said. No lecture in the world could have been more effective than Juan's story in teaching my boys gratitude and how privileged they were to get an education. And this was something that I, I never expected because Big Juan kept coming over and, and telling my boys, gosh, you are so lucky you get an education. How many kids in Orange County feel fortunate so that was a, a major thing that, that I didn't expect. Um, so my family grew closer in Belize because we didn't have cable TV, there were no shopping malls, there were no bookstores, uh, computers we did have, but as I said, uh, internet was sporadic. And they started helping without me saying anything. As an example, uh, with dishes, uh, they would, uh, you know, we didn't have a garbage disposer or a dishwasher, so the kids learned to finish whatever they put on their plates. Scooping leftover oatmeal or scrambled eggs out of the sink with their bare hands was pretty gross. And then one day uh, I was trying to cook in the oven and I said, does anyone know how the oven works? No, Duke said, I've never used it. Unlike my California oven, this one used gas. 
so I opened the door to figure out where to stick a match to light it. Just as my eyes reached mid-shelf, a huge rat made direct eye contact with me. I quickly shut the oven door, yelling, there's a rat in the oven. The boys immediately thought of Cookie, our suburban rat terrier, and opened the door to see whether she knew what rat terriers uh, were, had been bred for. All five of us stood behind Cookie, waiting for some entertainment. <laughs> she placed her front paws on the open oven door and wagged her tail. <laughs> Not quite the reaction we'd expected. She finally attempted to jump inside the oven just as the rat ran into a hole in the wall. I made mashed potatoes instead of baked potatoes for dinner. <laughs> so... The kids' priorities changed, too, because they could not get fresh milk. We had to drink powdered milk from Mexico. I mean, once in a while, there would be a fresh gallon of milk in the supermarket, and I say fresh, because it had actually been out on the, uh, shipped over from the mainland, and they left it sitting on the, on the runway in the sun for a couple of hours before it went into the refrigerator, so we knew that we shouldn't drink the milk there. I got sick several times on yogurt and milk. So we just drank powdered milk. And our new motto, because shopping was not easy with three boys who were hungry all the time, is if they don't have what you want, want what they have. Um, so buying food was a problem with a boat. I mean, stocking up with three sons, it was a full-time job. It took four hours to buy food. Uh, we, I had to rent a taxi to take me on the mainland, and, uh, not on the mainland, on the island to the different shops because frequently I, I'd want vegetables here and say, oh, no, I, no vegetables. It's just like, okay, so then we go to the next one. No, next week. And, you know, so you end up going to all these places and, and then you have to transport canned goods and that... I tried doing that on my bicycle with a backpack and I had all these cans of food or riding back on the sand to the house. It was, what an adventure. Uh, but anyway, so we learned to be grateful for what we had. And uh, the kids started doing things without television, without all that. There was fishing, of course. The local kids would be fishing at a four-year-old. I would find them with a hook and a line, and they would be fishing for their family for dinner. And the parents just let them out there. I mean, it was just amazing how much freedom these kids had. They could go swimming, they could go all that. They didn't, the parents weren't out there watching their children all the time. In fact, uh, we named a little one Monkey Boy because he could climb a, a palm tree just like a monkey, and he could hang upside down from everything. And his parents, because they were young as well, like 21 and 20, they just let him run around. So that, that was an eye-opening experience for me. Um, and life is at a much slower pace, obviously. So uh, Josh is sitting there just enjoying the view, looking at nature. There he's standing on a palm tree. And, you know, we had these gorgeous starfish right in front of our house, about a foot wide, and the water was clear. And my husband was finally reconnecting with his sons. And, you know, it, it kind of brings tears to my eyes because I, sh I should probably leave this to the end, but now that um, Alec, my middle son, is, is applying for medical school, um, he said that he had never seen his dad happier than he was in Belize, and that it made him realize how important it is to pick a profession or a go, to, you know, go to college, pick something that you really want to do in life. My husband, as I said, is a work comp attorney and has never really enjoyed his profession. So it's been stressful for me and for the kids, and I never knew that my kids realized that. So um, anyway, that's, that's later on. And then uh, one thing else that they would do is that they would just hang out there and talk for hours. You know, they would play in the sand and just things that 
very often, you know, you need toys, you need games, you need things. They'd kick coconuts. Uh, the, the local kids would play soccer with a coconut for four hours uh, and, and just keep themselves entertained. Um, so life was much more simple and it was about family. And of course, this is another story. My husband and I tried to get a business going. The first one was a legal transcription business. Did not work because what American company wants to handle or deal with Americans in Belize who don't have electricity <laughs> and, you know, they need their, their papers transcribed now and you say, oh no, sorry, next week maybe. Um, so that didn't work out. And then we tried on the island when we moved, we tried to start a, um, a property management business because we lived five miles north and there were no property managers there. And we thought, oh, great idea. Well, the minute we, my husband made a website for the business, he started doing, you know, like that, is it TripAdvisor that gives people recommendations of where they can shop for cheap and where they can buy this and that. Well, big mistake. Uh, the locals did not want us telling p American tourists where they could buy cheaper wine, where they could buy cheap beer. So we had sabotage. Um, and I have no proof, but it seemed awfully coincidental that the same day our boat was sinking when we were in it and water was come gushing through and my son had an old sailboat and the anchors had been cut off. Mm -hmm. So we realized that starting a business in Belize is not as easy as we had thought. Um, and we did have the right papers, you know, it's not like we were trying to do something illegally. We had uh, applied for the paperwork. So uh, after realizing all this, what was strange was that my boys they felt terrible that we couldn't get a business going and they were like brainstorming. How about we start a paintball business? <laughs> we need paintball on the island or they would come up with other ideas because the teenagers didn't have much to do on the island. So um, that's really reconnected us and um, uh, then after my kids, you know, saw that uh, or after I noticed that we had started reconnecting, we wondered whether we should move back to the US. Uh, we had a lot of issues, if you read my book, with the other homeowners from the US because they wanted to stay loyal to the locals. They didn't want to side with us um, because then things would happen to them, which is completely normal. I'm talking about property management. They didn't want us to start a business. So they started turning against us, telling us that we couldn't work, we couldn't do this, we couldn't do that, and gave us a long list of things which made life unpleasant. But what I realized was that it had actually solved what I wanted, which was to get my family back together, my son back on track. And I even saw my boys, this is my oldest, he built this boat out of plywood in a day with his uh, younger brother there. Um, Josh and they were starting to do things together things that you know in in California they would all go their own way and so I felt really happy about all the the things that had happened so I'll tell you a little bit um, the final conclusion that I came to after our year in Belize was all of us my sons included have learned to take risks in life to embrace adventure and to accept different ways of thinking about life's challenges. And though Belize failed to live up to my cliched vision of paradise, it taught me that paradise is not a place, but a state of being. I discovered my Caribbean paradise within my family, a gift far richer than I could have imagined possible. And for that, I shall remain eternally grateful to Belize. So, this is us, or my three sons and I, when we came back in, uh, this is 2009, in Laguna Beach. Um, I am happy to say that my oldest son graduated from University of Mi Michigan with an engineering degree. And the middle one, I told you, is at UCSB, and he wants to become a doctor, has applied to medical school. And my youngest, Josh, 
the one who I really feel close to, I think we're very similar, he is extremely compassionate. And when he came back to high school at El Toro, um, he said, you know, Mom, all the kids here, they just want to have a nice pair of jeans and they're competing with one another about shoes and who has the nice of this and that. And he said, I don't want that. I want to go to um, military school. And he ended up in New Mexico. He went to a, a good military school and now he's in the National Guard and he's trying to go into the Army and he's 18 and he wants to go active which is heartbreaking for me, but it's his passion. So I have to respect that. So thank you for listening to me. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer before we do the raffle. Thank you so much. How long were you guys there? How long were we there? One year. My husband was there a little bit longer because he went three months before us. And seriously, had we not had these issues, we'd be living in Belize today. I never knew how, um, you know, how difficult it is to, you can't, people told me, Sonia, the mistake that you made is that you tried to start a business too soon. You need to wait two years to see who you can trust. And I thought, two years, this is ridiculous. We were running out of money and I was, you know, there my husband was enjoying life reading a book every day, which caused another, <laughs> another series of problems. But um, I thought, you know, he's been working hard for 16 years. He deserves two months. And I gave him two months, but then after two months, I started saying, come on, come with me to town. We need to find a job, blah, blah, blah. And I was the one who was always, let's go to the Chamber of Commerce. We need to mix with the locals. So I think I was too pushy. We should have slowed down a little. Yeah? Uh, I mean, this is just kind of a question that I don't need the answer to now, but maybe someday. I mean, shop, most people can't just pack up and move right. to another country for a year. I mean, we all, most of us all have young kids, so is there, do you have any advice to, first of all, not get in the situation where you have to leave because you feel so disconnected with your family, but also, a, a, a more practical solution, like things that we could do with our family to, you know, to get to the same result of staying connected right. and close knit. I mean, uh, uh, besides the obvious, like don't watch as much TV, take away the video, you know, spend more time together right. as a unit. Anything like specific? Yeah, I, I thought of that. Um, you know, <laughs> of course, not everyone can move to Belize, but I just, you know, I know your children are young. And I will be honest with you, I, that was one of the lessons I learned, is that I thought that by being a stay-at-home mom, right, and because I had a wonderful relationship with my mother, I thought that my kids would, would be perfect, that there would be no problems because I did everything that, that I wanted, you know, that I think a mom should be. I was there for them and all this. And so one of the things that was a shock for me is that, of course, each child is different and each child um, adapted to Belize in a different manner. Um, as far as the, the thing that I could give you as advice is, um, I don't think we should micromanage our kids' lives. I think that we need to give them more time. And I, I'm just saying too many activities we always think, oh, we need to give them opportunities to do, you know, this sport and that sport and this and that and this and that. But I've heard psychologists say that, that children need downtime and time with mom and dad. And a lot of times we, we, we or, and I did that too, we take them to all these activities, but what they sometimes want is just to sit and, and talk and, and, uh, my son started opening up about what he wanted to do with his life in, when he was 13, 14. Something that he would never have done here in, because we, we had free time together. Um, I don't think it's good to give kids too many gifts. I don't agree with a lot of things because I'm from Europe and I'm, I was probably raised differently, but I think that we're too often wanting to please our children. Um, 
when all they really want is t time with you. You know, you sit and do a drawing with your child, that means more to them than going to the store and buying them stuff. It's the time you spend doing little things. And did you have um, warning signs before Christmas Day, whatever that? No, I son was troubled and was acting mm, out. No, I didn't know he had a girlfriend. And but I will tell you that because he was tall, everyone, including us, treated him as older. And I think we spoiled him. He was our oldest, our first son. And grandparents spoiled him. They were constantly, you know, admiring him. And it did cause tension too, because my sister-in-law got jealous that my son was born before her son, and the grandparents spent more time with my son and praised him rather than her son. And I thought that was terrible of grandparents to do that. And, and it's caused such a jealousy that unfortunately I think it's stayed for the rest of, we don't see. I never see my sister-in-law. Um, we've invited them many times, but she's never wanted to, to come over. So um, the other thing is, you know, when I'm not saying that every kid is going to turn bad. Of course not. But the moment we made that decision to not ship him away to a, a boarding school that does behavior modification, and the reason we did that is because, A, it's so expensive. We didn't want to spend all that money. And B, I, I thought that, you know, uh, we're a family. So the fact that we kept him as a family and did something drastic, and you could even move to another school district, it's not necessarily uh, move to another country. Just show him that you care, that you love him, even when he's misbehaving. Um, one of the things that the issues with our son was more the girlfriends. Their moms were divorced eight times, one of them eight times divorced and didn't care where her daughter was sleeping at night. She moved her suitcase into my house and moved her, her, her clothes into my son's room when he was 15 and she was 17. And I called the mom and I said, we need to talk. And she said, oh, she can do whatever she wants. So when parents start ignoring that they really need to show their child that they care and they, you know, then I, uh, I think more trouble arises. And the minute we pulled him away, he was a different person. So. I have a question. You, you had said, you mentioned earlier that, um, that he refused to come with you. Yeah, to first. the Lamanai. So how was that transition to him then? Did your oldest son then move at a later time? Or was no, he just didn't go to the house? Yeah, he didn't come to that, uh, oh, the okay. Mayan ruins. He did move with you to Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he did. But my husband had a huge argument with him after that, that uh, Lamanai thing. He said, you know what, this is an educational experience that you'll never get again. If all you want to do is sit in the hut and instant message your girlfriend in California till 3 o'clock in the morning, we're going to send you away. And the funny thing was, they, he said, we're going to send you to a military school, which is exactly what my youngest wanted to do. So it was like, we're punishing you with military school, but the youngest one was like, I want to go to military school. So that was kind of uh, strange. But um, so after that, uh, that, um, that uh, argument that my husband had with his son, it's like, I, I think I wanted my my husband to be more strong with the kids. That was the issue, is I felt like he wasn't disciplining them when he needed to, and the reason is he doesn't like confrontation. So I, I think a lot of our issues too were, I didn't want to yell and scream at them all the time. I wanted my husband to be the strong guy who did that. And uh, so that caused a little bit of conflict in our marriage. But uh, anyway. What were your kids' reaction when you told them about this idea? Because we've oftentimes yeah. thought of doing something like this, but I think, um, you know, I think this goes back to Michelle's question is, you know, when you have young kids, like mine are, you know, third grade and first grade, you know, what their reaction is, and really, are you doing the right thing by giving them this experience? You and know, I've been to Belize, so I know yeah. what you were doing in that hut with right. this. Oh, you did? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think you're speaking to the wrong person because having traveled as a young, uh, you know, person in, living in different countries, there is nothing in my opinion that's better for 
the world than to have young people see how others live in other countries. And the funny thing is that most people who do this kind of thing, they do it with small children. They don't do it with teenagers. Uh, I've researched how many books are out about uh, moving with teenagers, and the only one that I really found is a family that moved from California to Italy. Now, I wouldn't call Italy primitive, you know what I mean? And, and they had teenagers, so, uh, but they didn't adapt at all. Uh, Did but, your kids just think you, you guys were crazy? I mean, or you know, like, yeah, that's, that's something mom and dad would do. Yeah, well, uh, my husband had never traveled. I'm the one who, who's more, uh, I call myself gutsy. But uh, I love adventure, and um, they did think we were crazy. The middle son said, Jeff and Jake said I can live with them. I'm not coming. And Jeff and Jake's mom actually did invite him, my son to stay with them <laughs> while we were gone. But uh, we told her it was for the rest of our lives, so she <laughs> did not. Yeah, she died not. But um, no, I do think, I mean, even if it's for a short time, and you know, a lot of people say, well, you have to be rich to do this. But I always say, in Belize, a lot of people from the US move who are poor. They are living off Social Security. They don't have enough money to live in the US. So it's not true that you have to be rich. You could rent your house out and find something much cheaper there. You could do it for, you could do a home exchange. I, I love the idea of home exchanges. Um, there are so many websites and I'll be happy to give you help, information on that because I've connected with different women who uh, do this. One did it for five months with her kids. They were, I believe, seven and eight. And they moved to, it's, to Ireland, to France, to England for five months in, and stayed in different homes and rented their house in San Diego. Um, and she's, written a, she's writing a book about it, but she believes that it's the best thing. And now her daughter, who's in her early 20s, is actually studying at Oxford. And I think that this, uh, made her, she agrees, this is what opens up her mind to being more independent. I think it's important to teach our kids to be independent. Uh, that's our role. So, yeah. How did you handle the transition coming back and like to avoid getting into the same habits? That, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what, I'll be honest with you today, I am, in social media, doing sitting at my stupid computer for seven, seven days a week. I'm stressed, but it took six months. I would walk around and I would look at the trees when I came home and I would tell people, why are you hurrying like that? Just relax, relax. I would drive at 40 miles an hour when everyone was past me. I couldn't speed up. It was so difficult, and the, uh, when I went to the grocery store for the first time, the cereal aisle, I stood <laughs> and I looked like this, and the, the store manager came up and said, thought something was wrong with me. And he said, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I can't make a decision. I don't know what to buy, there's too many choices. <laughs> so, uh, and my son felt the same thing. We were like amazed by how much we have here that we take for granted. My kids are much more frugal. They don't want fancy stuff. They, they don't spend much money, which might not be a good thing if they get married. Uh, their <laughs> wives might not like it. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, they, they certainly have changed. And the way I've changed is we, that beautiful house that we had when we came back, we downsized, and one of the reasons is we didn't have money, but we downsized and downsized, and now I really don't want a nice house because I want to feel free. I want to feel that I can uproot and go, and I'm going to go to Africa or do Peace Corps work or something. Now that my, my youngest is 18, I'm free. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, what about grandkids and all this? Well, I want to hurry up and go before their grandkids because I, I just have this, it's my time. I've done my, my mom thing, now they're on their own. Yeah. So you have me very fired up. My husband and I... <laughs> Good! I have, I have three sons. Um, my husband and I backpacked around.
around the world for 15 months before we had our first kid as our last hurrah, mostly developing countries. Okay. So we're counting the moments until we can do something with our mm -hmm. kids. My youngest just turned one, so in like two years we want to go to New Zealand for uh, oh, yeah. a few months and just go between the islands. But what age would you think is... A good, I mean, I know you did it with older kids, right? but you've researched a lot and kind of thought about it. What age do you think would be a good key age if you were to do something like this to relocate for a year or two that would, I want them to remember it. Right. I want them to get a lot of good quality life lessons out of it, mm -hmm. um, but I will also want it to be in a good flow with their life stages and socially and stuff like that. So have you thought about that? Um, or do you have an opinion? Yeah. You know, the, uh, I, I, I think that you should do things when you want to do them, and you shouldn't worry as much about is it the right time, is it not the right time. I think we worry constantly that we're not doing the right thing. And, um, you know, I, I, uh, I'll tell you, we were very fortunate to go on a safari. My dad lives in Europe, and he paid for my family to go on a safari, yeah. But my youngest was, uh, we didn't take, uh, Josh was two, so he, we didn't take him, but um, Alec was um, six, and his brother was nine. So we went on a safari with a six and a nine-year-old, and I swear this, my six-year-old remembers so much more about that safari than I remember. And I think he says that's influenced him as well with his, he studied biology. Every little experience that you can do with your children is something that you don't realize that you're planting those seeds for later on in life. Um, so I, I would encourage you, I would even do it with a one-year-old. In fact, I read a book, not that he would or she would remember, but um, a couple from New Zealand who had five kids. And, they, and the youngest was, I think, three months. And they uprooted and moved to Italy from New Zealand. Okay, the, ma the man was, was wealthy. So he had uh, money and he could take, you know, that's why they had five kids. And, and they were both gorgeous. I mean, he was like a supermodel. His wife was gorgeous too. <laughs> And, uh, and his book is gorgeous because <laughs> the quality of the paper and the photos of the family, it's like, oh yes, your children are gorgeous. <laughs> so anyway, um, so they, they moved to Italy and then they, they decided another adventure after they bought an island in the Caribbean and they built this gorgeous, gorgeous house from scratch. It was their own island and they imported everything from Italy. So all their antiques and everything on, yeah, on this yeah. Caribbean island. But anyway, that's a different story. <laughs> but just to point out now. <laughs> but my, um, another thing is I have a cousin um, and her husband is a high school teacher. They moved to New Zealand with their children when they were 10 and, and 12. And they spent a year in New Zealand. And they, um, they had the best experience there. They, basically, they rented houses in the north and in the south because they wanted to ski and they wanted to surf. And they had, their kids went to school with the Maori children, yes. which was an experience too. So, um, no, I think, you know, any age. I mean, do it two or three times. Don't yeah. just do it once. So. And I had the same experience when we got back from our trip. I was standing in the toothpaste aisle, and I literally had tears in my eyes. And I'm like, this is ridiculous, because in Vietnam, it took us a whole day to buy one or two toothpaste. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Thank you. Should we do the raffle? Or? Yeah. I'll get the bowl. <laughs>
Is Tanya, Tanya Havanesian? That's you? You won um, a copy of my book? And I'll give you the book. Can you pull one more name? Sure, please. Who's that? Oh, Desiree. Desiree, you won the um, earrings. questions for the group of people. I'll bring some wine and cheese. And uh, as long as you have a, a not, you know, maybe 10 people or so in your group, I'd be happy to come. And today I'm doing, um, my book is $14.95 and if you want to buy a second one, it's $12. So, thank you so much. I have the book. Have you read it? Yeah. I haven't read the whole thing yet. I started it. I'm ready to read it. 